I think you can get the video on the Midlothian Police Department's Facebook website. Uh, look at the video. Uh, the person has a very distinct walk. Uh, there's a, just a very distinct uh, mannerism about this person that should be a very apparent to somebody. At 3.50 a.m. on Monday the 18th of April 2016, surveillance cameras captured a suspect breaking into a church in Midlothian, Texas. Dressed head to toe in fake SWAT gear, the suspect roamed the halls and rooms with a crowbar and a hammer, occasionally breaking a door or a window in. There was no reason to rob the building. It was a church after all. So why were they there? These videos would be the last moments recorded inside the church before Missy Beavers was due to arrive to host her fitness class for the morning. Unfortunately, she would never leave that building alive again. Who killed Missy Beavers? And who was the suspect in the surveillance footage? My name's Adrian, and welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. Grab a coffee and sit back. Let's investigate. Missy Beavers was born on August the 9th, 1970, to her mother and father Norma and James Strickland. She grew up in Young County, Texas, and graduated from Jacksboro High School in 1998. After high school, she attended Tarleton State University, where she obtained a degree in sciences and graduated that in 1995. Once university was over, she became a teacher, specialising in helping children with special needs and shortly after that she met a gentleman called Brandon Beavers. The two would marry in 1998. Now Missy was also a smart cookie. She breezed through her degree in sciences, but she was also free-spirited, and she wanted to spend her life helping others. And in 2015, she became a fitness class instructor for Camp Gladiator, a company dedicated to helping others achieve their fitness goals. She ran these classes in a variety of locations around Texas, including a location no other than Creekside Church of Christ in Midlothian, Texas. Midlothian is just 25 miles away from Dallas, with roughly 30,000 inhabitants calling it home. The city's main industries are in cement, steel, and schooling. But a lot of residents just simply live there, while they commute to Dallas and Fort Worth for the working weeks. The date was April the 17th, 2016. It was a Sunday. Her husband Brandon was on a fishing trip in Mississippi, so Missy was taking the weekend off, just relaxing at home. But she did have a commitment to run her fitness class the following morning. Throughout the weekend, Midlothian had suffered from exceptionally poor weather, and it wasn't expected to change any time soon either. But in response to the rain, Missy posted on Facebook to say, If it's raining, we're still training. No excuses, you are gladiators. Now you'll never find me up this early for exercise, but for Missy it was a different story. Her session, booked at 5pm at Creekside Church, was full. So at 9.30 she gave a quick call to her husband, said goodnight to one of her groups in Facebook, got into bed and fell asleep. The next morning of April the 18th, 2016, at 1.58am, just across the road from Creekside Church, surveillance cameras from a shop detected a car behaving bizarrely. The shop was a family-run firearms retailer, and so the building was shut overnight. But there, the unidentified vehicle could be seen aimlessly prowling the car park, often stopping to turn all their lights off, and flashing the headlights in the dark. It roamed for six minutes before driving away. No one was around to notice the car, and so nothing was reported. Neither did the driver commit any offence, only that it was odd that they were there. Back the other way, Missy was expected to arrive at Creekside Church at about 4.30 in the morning to set up for her fitness class. The church didn't hold much of value. Maybe a decent sound system, and money from donations the day before, but it had a surveillance camera system nevertheless. And although it had several cameras installed in the building, 
All cameras inspecting the exterior of the church were not operational that night. The church is located along Highway 287. Fields and trees cover the remaining three flanks. The building is isolated and quite large for its kind, with a car park surrounding it. The firearms shop along with a wedding venue can be found across the highway, and a small airport lies just northeast. The following self-created floor plan describes the layout of Creekside Church. And at 3.50am that morning, surveillance cameras inside the church were activated, capturing an unknown individual breaking in. They were covered in faux SWAT gear, and walking in a calm demeanour. Cameras first record them walking away, down a half-lit hallway. Footsteps probably the only noise to break through the nighttime silence. And although cameras didn't show the point of entry to the church, police confirmed that they gained access by breaking through a side delivery door in the kitchen. The suspect was in no rush or hurry. They strolled slowly from room to room with a distinctive duck-footed gait, looking through every door along the way. One observation is that any attempt made to open a door was not met with much force. Here, the suspect makes hardly any effort to pry open the storage room door. No weight was put into it. Next, another camera in the same location but facing down the other hallway captures the suspect walking past the southwest entrance. On the other side of this entrance would be where Missy later parks her car. They peer into another unlocked room with a Dutch door. This is a children's playroom. And then they move into an adjacent room, which has a series of side doors that lead on to the next. The suspect eventually leaves an office door, the surveillance camera reactivated by motion detection, and walks back towards the camera with a headlight activated, before entering the worship centre. And a few minutes later, a fourth camera records the suspect leaving an eastern-facing room. Just out of the camera's view, they spot a locked storage room and smash the glass to gain access. This is where the surveillance footage released to the public ends. At this point in the footage, the suspect has spent about 30 minutes in the church, and completed almost one entire circuit around the layout. And just minutes later, at 4.16am, Missy Beavers arrives at the church grounds. She parks her car and enters the building at around about 4.20am, leaving her car parked in the south-facing awning. And while the surveillance footage showing Missy entering the church has never been released to the public, it would be the last time that she was ever seen alive again. Just 40 minutes later, students from her class entered the church, and found her lying on the floor, covered in puncture wounds. They called the police immediately. Friends, family, and media were devastated. Missy's murder quickly gained state and nationwide attention, but nobody could identify the person in the surveillance footage. So, what do we know about the suspect? The obvious first impression is that they were wearing full SWAT gear, though it's confirmed that it was not genuine. They either bought it off a third-party website or even a novelty store. They also have a headlamp attached to their head, which can be used to operate hands-free, or to dazzle anyone in front of them. The suspect also doesn't appear to have great motion control of their legs, and walks with a stiffness with their feet splayed outward from their body. Their feet also sometimes drags while walking. Their odd way of walking could be down to injury, surgery, being overweight, or from wearing oversized boots to mask their shoe size. One other consideration that isn't often talked about is that it could also be put on to full surveillance viewers. Forensics concluded from the Dutch door that the height range of the suspect was between 5 foot 2 and 5 foot 7 without uniform most likely 5 foot 8 with uniform. So we've already observed the lack of effort in prying open the locked door, but it was also noted that they exerted no animation into breaking the glass panel or while opening doors. In fact, all of their attempts in vandalising the church don't seem to be genuine in nature, 
it rather looks like a half-hearted attempt to stage the scene to look as if it were subject to random vandalisation. The suspect is most likely right-handed, as most functions are performed with it over their left hand. They are also seen holding the box of something in their left hand, and although it is not known what the box is for, people have speculated it to be a light bulb box, a knife box, and a scope box. But what do you think the box was for? Let me know in the comments below. One of the main confusions to this case is whether the suspect is a male or a female, and opinions on the matter seem to be 50-50 straight down the middle. I'm led to believe that it's a female. At one point, the suspect pauses and turns, and there is something vaguely feminine about the way they moved. Enhancements to one of the segments of the surveillance footage also shows the suspect's eyes in better detail. To me, the facial features are soft, like a female's eyebrows. Despite the range of characteristics, the weird walk, and the full surveillance of the body of the suspect, no one has ever been identified or arrested. In fact, not even a motive could be determined. The church still had money from the previous day in its office, and audio equipment was never touched. Missy Beaver's body was found with her jewellery and her phone, so this rules out the motive of robbery. If the motive was vandalism, this is usually committed with anger and rage. Yet, all attempts of damage seemed emotionless, and the suspect remained calm and docile to all their actions through the surveillance footage. And did they know that they were being recorded by CCTV? They did put a lot of effort into concealing their identity after all, and the cameras outside the church were coincidentally not running that day. It is possible that the vehicle that was captured by footage across the road earlier that evening may have been scouting the area first to make sure that they could get away, but police aren't sure. Following Missy's death, police searched through texts, emails, and questionable messages sent to her through LinkedIn. A handful of phone numbers that had been in contact with Missy were also reviewed, but nothing substantial came from this. Missy Beaver's husband, Brandon, couldn't avoid being questioned by police, but it's confirmed that he was in Mississippi on a fishing trip the morning she was killed. Police tracked his mobile phone to cell towers in the area, he had a solid alibi. However, it was also noted that the two were going through marital problems shortly before her death. Strong allegations surfaced that she was having an affair just before, and the two were also financially struggling to make ends meet. People were quick to highlight that it was rather convenient that Brandon was out of state on the weekend that she was killed. People started to rumour that maybe he had hired a hitman or a hit woman. However, there is no evidence to support this. But on the mention of affair, could Missy have perhaps been having an affair with someone who also had a partner? And could that partner potentially have been jealous? Missy had a very public lifestyle. She shared her personal information and her locations all the time. Even the post the night before she was murdered revealed her expected time and location, so it wouldn't have been difficult for the killer to get there early and wait. There were other suspects too, but even the most sensational of those were drawn blank in the end. Just four days after Missy was murdered, her father-in-law, Randy Beavers, took a bloodstained shirt to the dry cleaners. The dry cleaner reported it to the police, and Randy was pulled in for questioning. And as he arrived at the police station, media recorded him and the way he walked. Understandably, the way he did walk looked strikingly similar to that of the suspect. However, Randy also had an alibi. He was in California that morning and the blood found on the shirt was actually that of the family's pet chihuahua. The dog had gotten a fight two days prior, and the vet confirmed this story. An ex-police officer named Bobby Wayne Henry was also suspected at one point. Not only had he worked security, but he also attended the same church that Missy was murdered in. He too, however, had a strong alibi and passed a polygraph test. He was therefore later dropped from suspicion. In 
It has now been almost five years since the murder of Missy Beavers, and we are still none the wiser to solving the case. Still no one knows who the suspect is. All we know is in the dark of an early April morning, someone wearing fake police gear infiltrated into the church, broke their way in, stalked the rooms and halls, and then killed the incoming Missy Beavers. And after all this time, so many questions still remain open to this case. Was this a planned murder? Or was it a murder through opportunity? Was the suspect a man or a woman? Did they know there was surveillance before they entered the church? Did they disable the cameras outside the church? Was the car seen earlier involved in her murder? And was the killer hired? I'll let you come to your own conclusions, but I'd love to hear what you think. Thank you so much for watching another video of mine. If you enjoyed this case, please remember to like and subscribe. Coffeehouse Crime does solved and unsolved cases on a weekly basis, so if that is your thing, please hang around. Thank you once again, and we'll meet in the next one. Take care of each other. Goodbye.